Let us come back to the uh, Ratna Pala Sutta. <coughs> and uh, I'm not going to spend too much more time on this sutta. I'm just going to quickly go through how uh, Ratna Pala explains this to the king. It is a similar way to what I was explaining, but in a more kind of down-to-earth terms probably. Yeah. So the king says he doesn't understand. We are now on page 64. Yeah the top of page 64, huh? and with actually at the bottom of page 63, the king says, how should the meaning of the world is unstable, it is swept away, how should this be understood? Huh? And then on the top of page 64, Ratapala gives the answer. Huh? And this is what he says, huh? what do you think, great king, when you were 20 or 25 years old, uh, you were an expert rider of elephants, uh, an expert horseman, an expert charioteer, an expert archer, an expert swordsman, strong in thighs and arms, sturdy, capable in battle. When I was 20, 25 years old, Master Tapala, I was all of those things. Sometimes I wonder if I had super normal power then, I do not see anyone who could equal me in strength. What do you think, Red King? Are you now as strong in thighs and arms, as sturdy and as capable in battle? No, Master Ratapala, now I am old, aged, burdened with years, advanced in life, come to the last stage. My years have turned 80. Sometimes I mean to put my foot here, and I put my foot somewhere else. <laughs> That's kind of sweet, isn't it? That's sweet, yeah. It's very so this is what happens when you get old. So <laughs> and then the Ratapala says, Great King, it was on account of this that the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened, said, Life in any world is unstable, it is swept away. And when I knew and saw and heard this, I went forth from the home life into homelessness. It is wonderful, Master Ratapala, it is marvelous how well it has been expressed by the Blessed One who knows and sees. Life in any world is unstable, it is swept away, it is indeed so. So it is the idea of impermanence again, yeah? How you can't, nothing to hold on to, nothing to take your stand on, everything changing. <coughs> that is what it's about. And then the king says, Master Ratapala, there exists in this court elephant troops and cavalry and chariot troops and infantry which will serve to subdue any threats to us. Now Master Ratapala said, life in any world has no shelter and no protector. How should the meaning of that statement be understood? What do you think, Great King? Do you have any chronic ailment? I have a chronic wind ailment, Master Ratapala. Sometimes my friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives stand around me thinking, now King Kauravya is about to die. He is about to die. What do you think, Great King? Can you, can you command your friends and companions, your kinsmen and relatives? Come, my good friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives, all of you share my present painful feeling so that I may feel less pain. Or do you have to feel that pain yourself alone? I cannot command anyone, Master Ratapala. I have to feel that pain alone. A very simple way of explaining the idea of no protector. But in the end, we have to take responsibility. In the end, we are, we have to deal with our own problems. There is no one to help us out. That's obviously the message here. <coughs> and uh, so this is what uh, that is about. And then he says, Great King, it was an account of this that the Blessed One said, life in the world has no shelter and no protector. It is wonderful, it is a marvelous Master Ratapala that the Blessed One said this, etc. Master Ratapala, there exists in this court abundant gold coins and bullion stored away in vaults and lofts. Now Master Ratapala said, life in any world has nothing of its own. One has to leave all and pass on. How should the meaning of that statement be understood? What do you think, Great King? You now enjoy yourself provided and endowed with the five kinds of sensual pleasure. That is the five senses. Yeah? 
But will you be able to have it of the life to come? Let me likewise enjoy myself provided and endowed with these same five kinds of sensual pleasures. Or will others take away this property while you will have to pass on according to your actions? I cannot have it thus of the life to come, Master Atapala. On the contrary, others will take over this property while I shall have to pass on in accordance with my actions. So, uh, yeah, obvious, yeah, this is what we've been talking about all the time. Death, everything has to go, and uh, the gold coin and the gold bullion is only the beginning of what has to go, much more obviously. You can see he's talking to a layman king who is not so well versed in the Dhamma, so he's going quite gently with him. He's not kind of, kind of really hammering it in, he's being quite careful, which is, I suppose, compassionate. Great King, it was on account of this that the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened, said, Life in any world has nothing of its own. One has to leave all and pass on. It is wonderful, Master Pala. It is marvelous how the Blessed One who knows and sees could say this. Now, Master Atapala said, Life in any world is incomplete, insatiate, a slave of craving. How should the meaning of that statement be understood? What do you think, Great King? Do you reign over the rich Kuru country? Yes, Master Atapala, I do. What do you think, Great King? Suppose a trustworthy and reliable man came to you from the East and said, Please know, Great King, that I have come from the East and there I saw a large country, powerful and rich, very populous and crowded with people. There are plenty of elephant troops there, plenty of cavalry, chariot troops and infantry. There's plenty of ivory there, plenty of gold coins and bullion, both unworked and worked, and plenty of women for wives. With your present forces you can conquer it. Conquer it then, great king. What would you do? We would conquer it and reign over it, Master Atapala. <laughs> what do you think, great king? Suppose a trustworthy and reliable man came from the west, from the north, from the south, from across the sea, and said, Please know, great king, that I have come from across the sea, and there I saw a large country with all of the same characteristics. Conquer it then, great king. What would you do? I would conquer it too, and reign over it, Master Atapala. <laughs> great king, it was an account of this, that the blessed one who knows and sees, said, Life in any world is incomplete, insatiate, the slave of craving. And when I knew and saw this, I went forth from the home life into homelessness. In such a beautiful way of looking at it. <coughs> it doesn't matter how much you have, you know. If you have one country, you want another country. If you have two, you want another one. And it's like there is no end. Yeah? It's, it's like if you own the whole planet, then of course you would want another planet. And it carries on and carries on like this forever. And you're never satisfied. And the reason you cannot be satisfied is because Craving doesn't deal with the root problem. Because it doesn't deal with the root problem, craving doesn't subside. That is really the issue. The root problem is a psychological lack that can never be fulfilled by external things. That is the real problem. So that is what you are seeing here. And that is why the craving just carries on for potentially forever unless you get out of this mess. Great King, it was an account of this that the Blessed One who knows and sees said, Life in any world is incomplete, insatiate, the slave of craving. Yeah. And when I knew and saw and heard this, I went forward from the home life into homelessness, uh, houselessness. Uh. It is wonderful, Master Tapala, it is marvelous uh, how well that has been expressed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, uh, accomplished and fully awakened. Uh. Life in any world is incomplete, insatiate, the slave of craving. It is indeed so. So, that is the last part of the Rata Pala Sutta. So, uh, um, there you are. I, I think that Sutta is really nice. It kind of encapsulates almost the whole idea of the Dhamma just in four simple lines, yeah? And you can kind of almost draw any Dhamma teaching you wish out of those four lines. It's almost as if the entire 
Pitaka, Sutta Pitaka exists within those four lines because they are so compressed and beautiful statement of the Dhamma. And uh, this is one of the weird things, you know, sometimes you, uh, there's a sutta where the Buddha is asked, how much Dhamma do you actually need to know? And uh, the Buddha says, if you have one verse of Dhamma that is well spoken, uh, and you understand that fully, that is all you really need to know. Uh, yeah, because the entire Pitik Sutta Pitaka is like contained, if you wish, into one verse, uh, if the verse is really pithy and compact and uh, has everything in it. Like the famous Ovada Patimoka verse, uh, which probably many of you will know. Uh, Sabba papasa akaranang, kusalasa upasampada, sa chitta pariyoda panang, etang buddhana sasanang. Yeah, to not to do what is bad, to do what is good, to purify your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Uh, very famous verse found in the Patimokha. Uh, and if you know that much, really the whole teaching is there. But sometimes you need a bit of flesh to kind of understand what is going on. But really, the whole thing is there. Uh, very simple. Uh, so, that is that sutta. We have one sutta left to go, the famous Portalia Sutta. And um, let's see, uh, there is like an essential part of this. But before I go on to that one, I s mentioned yesterday when we were reading out the, uh, the uh, uh, Kachanagota Sutta, the one on the uh, uh, dependent origination. Uh, yeah? And uh, in, that, uh, why in, in that, I was saying that some of the translations I disagreed with Alan Sudato. I said I had put it up and uh, asked him specifically. Uh, and he basically agreed with my, my complaints about this translation. So now he has come back and said he agrees. So now you have it uh, on a f real, it's proper grounds that those translations might have been a bit dodgy. Uh, so uh, there you are. So he has agreed with my critiques. I'm very happy to, to say that. Uh, so just to kind of make that absolutely clear so no, there's no doubt remains <laughs> about that one. Uh, you remember those little things? Uh, why in? Can't remember. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Just, uh, we'll, we, talk, we can talk about it later on if you like. Yeah. But let us come back to the uh, Portalia Sutta. And uh, I think what I will do, I will skip a lot of the preliminary things uh, because uh, we only have one session left after this, uh, and uh, during that last session, I think I want to do something else, like uh, uh, re-talk just briefly about the Four Noble Truths again, just to recap on everything, uh, and maybe we can have a bit of discussion or whatever. I don't think I want to continue with the suttas after this particular session. This should be the last session, I think. Uh, so to do that, let us just uh, look at the similes. That's what I usually like to do anyway. And uh, so far we have looked at how to deal with uh, things like ill will. Uh, we have looked at some of the basic ideas of Buddhism about how to think about death and old age and illness and all of these kind of things. Uh, and now what I want to look at is a little bit about how to deal with the sensual world, uh, the material world, uh, the objects, how to think about that in a way so that we reduce some of the attachments and we make it easier to practice the spiritual path instead. We get our priorities right, yeah? We remember what really is important in life. Uh, and this is kind of the critical thing, knowing what really matters in life. Uh, if you always remember what matters, uh, you will be doing really well. Uh, but it's so easy to get sidetracked. So this is kind of to help you to avoid getting sidetracked uh, and uh, uh, remembering what actually is really required. Uh, so here, <coughs> You can turn to page 73 uh, in your booklet. Uh, and the number of the things here you will have, uh, we will have talked about already. So now I'm just going to talk about them a, a little bit more. Uh, and uh, then, uh, um, yeah, that, and that should be enough hopefully here. Uh, so these are the seven similes. Yeah? The Buddha is about to tell this householder, Portalia, the dangers of the objects of the sensual world. Not just the objects, but also the craving. Uh, this is about the uh, adinava, the disadvantage or danger in karma. Karma is a sensuality. It both refers to the objects of the sensual world, the things we attach to, and also refers to the desire of the heart. Uh, so this is what the Buddha has to say to this householder. Householder, suppose a dog, overcome by hunger and weakness, was waiting by a butcher's shop. 
than a skilled butcher or his apprentice was, would toss the dog a well-hacked, clean-hacked skeleton of meatless bones, smeared with blood. What do you think, householder? Would that dog get rid of his hunger and weakness by uh, gnawing, such, gnawing, gnawing such a well-hacked, clean-hacked skeleton of meatless bones smeared with blood? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Uh, because that was a skeleton of well-hacked, clean-hacked, meatless bones smeared with blood. Uh, eventually that dog would reap weariness and disappointment. Uh, so too, householder, the noble disciple considers thus, uh, sensual pleasures have been compared to a skeleton by the Blessed One. Uh, they provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. So these are the very stark similes about sensual pleasures, and the reason why they are so stark is because it's so unusual for us uh, to think about sensual world in this way. The sensual world is something that normally seems attractive, yeah, we're just enjoying ourselves, having some nice food and having some good relationships or whatever and enjoying some nice entertainment. Uh, and uh, then to turn that mind to understand a little bit what is going on, uh, these very powerful similes were then invented by the Buddha to make the point. Uh, yeah, so it's like a hungry dog waiting outside a butcher's shop, yeah, this is the cr this is a picture of craving, yeah? An animal, when they crave, they really crave very strongly, they have no idea what's going on, and they just crave and crave. And looking in through the window, seeing all the meat inside, and the craving becomes stronger and stronger. And eventually, that butcher throws out a bone. But that bone doesn't have any sustenance on it, there's no meat on it, all the meat is too valuable to give to the dog. The bone has a little bit of blood, that's all it has. And then that dog, kind of gets the taste of the blood, yeah, and it kind of is, is a taste of the sensuality, but it doesn't give the sustenance to the dog. The craving is almost exactly like it was before. As for a tiny moment, the dog might forget about the craving, then the craving re-arises. And when the craving re-arises, that dog goes on to the next butcher shop, waiting outside again, hoping to find a kind butcher. But in this simile, there are no kind butchers. All the butchers are equally mean, yeah, they just, all they ever throw out is bones with blood and there's never any meat on those blooming bones, uh, for that poor dog never gets any sustenance. Uh. And this is the simile of human beings in samsara. We crave, we run around, uh, you get the occasional bone, the occasional bone is like you get, you know, you, get, you have a meal and you're satisfied for a while before craving arises again, uh, or you have a, a, a relationship and it kind of lasts for a while, or you have a some kind of encounter and it lasts for a while and then it's gone again and craving re-arises uh, and then it, it's why you run after the same kind of idea of pleasure again in the future uh, and the craving comes back and it's gone for a short while and it comes back again and gone for a short while uh, and we're running after this and there's no way we're ever going to get satisfied in this way. Uh, all we do is suffer like this dog. Uh, yeah, never any sustenance. We never feel complete inside. Uh, and this is kind of the weird thing, it's actually very obvious when you think about it, I've already mentioned it many times, because the, there's a mental lack, there's a mental hole inside of us, there's a psychological uh, lack. How can you fill a psychological lack through external things? You can't, yeah, it's a psychological problem, it was always return as soon as that external thing is gone, exactly the same hole, the same lack will be there inside of you. That's why the craving always comes back. Yeah? There's only one way to fill up a psychological lack, to change your psychology. You have to think differently. Yeah? And this is where the spiritual path comes in. Yeah? The spiritual path is about filling up the hole inside by contentment, by joy, by positive qualities. That is what fills you up inside. The external thing is just like a band-aid which lasts for a minute and is gone again. But this is the real way to filling yourself up inside. So when you build up the contentment and joy and positive qualities, and one day you enter a state of samadhi, for the first time in your life, craving is completely gone. You feel utterly satisfied. The hole, the rash, that itch that you're always carrying with you is gone. And it's kind of, what happened? It's like you have, it, the feeling, of course, at that point, it is as if you have found the meaning of life. Because the craving that has been making you run around, that seemed like you were chasing something that would give you meaning. 
but you can never find it. And now, instead, you sat down on your bottom, you practiced in the right way, you got into a state of samadhi, you have found everything that craving always said was going to get you right there and then. Completely satisfied. You don't want to move anymore. And when you don't want to move anymore, then by definition, you have found profound meaning. If you don't have meaning, you want to move to find it. If you have found meaning in a true goal, there's no need to move anymore, because you have found what you're looking for. So if you are 100% content, don't want to go anywhere, it means you have found the answer to what life is all about. And it happens very strangely in meditation practice, when you just feel bliss and joy and contentment. You have everything you ever wanted, that's where it happens. And this is the simile, and it shows you the difference between the craving world, the dog running around, and eventually uh, settling down and finding, filling in that hole inside of us. And then you take it further, then you get the insights as well, based on that samadhi, which then ends that craving once and for all. And then it never re-arises again. Does it make sense what I'm saying here? Yeah? It's quite... It's not that hard to understand, that is the little, little bit of the way. Yeah? You get some idea what is going on. What may be hard to understand is how meditation can actually get you there. Yeah? And that is where you have to have some degree of confidence. Some of you will know some of this already, because you already had, uh, at least on the way, these kind of experiences, yeah? partly at least. Uh, maybe some of you had some very profound experiences, I don't know. Yeah? But, uh, so you already have some idea that this is true. Yeah? But actually, it can be taken further. Yeah? This is kind of the exciting part about this. Uh, and this is why the spiritual path is so interesting, because it actually gives you all those things that you ever wanted in your life. Uh, it is found on the spiritual path. Uh, this is why this is about the meaning of life. This is why I say Buddhism is about the meaning of life, and nothing else can really give it to you in the same way here. Uh, at least not the ordinary world. Uh. So that is the first one, yeah? So the, the essential pleasures are like a skeleton, they are like all these bones, they don't give any sustenance. The second one, householders suppose a vulture, a heron or a hawk seized a piece of meat and flew away. And then other vultures, herons or hawks pursued it and pecked it and clawed it. What do you think, householder, if that vulture, heron or hawk does not quickly let go of that piece of meat? wouldn't it incur death or deadly suffering because of that? Uh, yes, Venerable Sir, so too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a piece of meat by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. And I have mentioned this simile before, uh, during this retreat, and uh, the idea here is just the idea that we are always fighting over sensual pleasures. Uh, yeah? The world only has, the, the economy is only so large, uh, there's only so much to go around, uh, and then we fight over who gets to have more. Uh, and so much of our life is this rivalry about who gets to have the most. Yeah? Everyone wants to become a billionaire or a millionaire. Uh, yeah, but not everyone can be a billionaire, because there's not, not enough resources for everyone to be a billionaire. So it doesn't work. Yeah. So that's why we end up fighting. That's why people get corrupt. Why do they get corrupt? Because they want more money the quick way, rather than actually doing things the correct way. Yeah. That's why people cheat on others. That's why when they are salespeople, they, they kind of praise their product a little bit too much, yeah, and put down the rival's product. Yeah and these kind of things. And that's why we do all of these things in the world that are dodgy. And uh, we have rivalries and things, and very often we end up fighting as a consequence. Yeah? Fighting over things in the world, fighting over the inheritance, fighting over sp uh, spouses and, and partners in life, fighting as children over things. And uh, so much of the violence in the world stems at root from the search for sensual pleasures. The Buddha analyzes this beautifully, how craving is always the root of violence and uh, conflict in the world. Conflict comes, is rooted almost always in, in sensual pleasures, uh, or other kinds of cravings as well. Uh. And that is kind of scary, isn't it? That if you are interested in sensual pleasures, uh, then this whole side of violence and rivalry and conflict always comes with it. Uh. It's impossible to live a life dedicated to worldly happiness and not have conflict. Conflict always comes with that. 
Isn't that kind of off-putting? Yeah, it, we think that we are pursuing these happy dreams in the world. Yeah, we're having a nice house, nice car, everything is going to be beautiful. But actually, with that, there's always an inherent component of conflict comes with that. It's impossible just to have those good things without the conflict. The conflict always comes with it. Ill will is always just around the corner when you are pursuing uh, uh, your cravings. Uh, yeah, When you don't get the cravings satisfied, things don't go right, uh, then the ill will is uh, so close uh, because of the disappointment or whatever that comes with that. And then you start to do all kinds of crazy things, lead to more problems. Uh. So this is one of those very, to my mind, off-putting things about sensuality, that violence and uh, Rivalry and conflict always comes with it. And this is what that is about. Yeah? The bird carrying the meat coming into conflict with other birds because everyone wants that meat. Everyone wants to fight over the economic pie. <coughs> Householder, suppose, suppose a man took a blazing grass torch and went against the wind. What do you think, householder, if that man does not quickly let go of that blazing grass torch, uh, wouldn't that blazing grass torch burn his hand or his arm or some other part of his body uh, so that he might incur death or death-like suffering because of that? Uh, not deadly suffering, but death-like suffering. Uh, deadly suffering, I don't know what that is. Death-like suffering is the appropriate translation. <coughs> Yes, Venerable Sir, so too, Householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Uh, sensual pleasures have been conquered, uh, sorry, compared to a grass torch by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Uh, so a grass torch yeah, is something which is useful if you're in the dark, you want to see. Uh, so you have a grass torch, uh, but the grass torch is also problematic, yeah, because a grass torch is made of straw, so things tend to come off very quickly, and if you go against the wind, what does it mean to go against the wind here? Well, to go against the wind means to attach, yeah? So you attach to essential pleasure, that is going against the wind, you're going against the, the right way of dealing with these things. Uh, and when you attach to essential pleasures, you are asking for suffering. Yeah? The moment you're attached, uh, you know there will be suffering in the future because you're going to have to let go sooner or later. It will be taken from you again. Uh, so the moment you take up sensual pleasures in the wrong way, against the wind, then you are already doomed to have some suffering as a consequence. Uh, that is just the way it goes. Uh, so, uh, of course, it, so a grass torch is useful to some extent, but also very painful if you use it wrongly. Uh, that's kind of the point here. Uh, Okay, let's go on to the next one. Householder, suppose there were a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height, full of glowing coals without flame or smoke. Then a man came who wanted to live and not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain. And two strong men seized him by both arms and dragged him towards that charcoal pit. What do you think, householder? Would that man twist his body this way and that way? Yes, Venerable Sir, why is that? Because that man knows that if he falls into that charcoal pit, he will incur death or death-like suffering because of that. So too, Householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a charcoal pit by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering, much despair, while the danger in them is great. So what do you think? The sensual objects of the world, are they like a charcoal pit? I think, I think that's true. Huh? <laughs> Hard to see, isn't it? Uh, I, it's kind of almost something... <coughs> Sometimes there are things in the suttas you have to take them on board on confidence and faith. It's very hard to relate to some of them. This is a very strong simile, very powerful. Yeah, maybe you have something nice in your life. Uh, I was, uh, it was interesting because the other day I was joking about people being interested in BMWs. Uh, yeah? And then someone drove me to the doctor and guess what kind of car it was. <laughs> so that was, oh, okay. <coughs> Sometimes you have to be careful, but I, I don't think she minded at all, actually. She knew we were just messing around. But uh, 
So, you know, you have this beautiful car, or whatever it is, uh, and it's a charcoal pit. Uh, how do you how do you get make sense of that? Uh, or you have this beautiful relationship with somebody, it's a charcoal pit. Why why is that the case? Uh, and it's and, and the reason is, and, and the reason the way to understand this uh, is that uh, uh, we have our perceptions are so distorted. Uh, yeah, that actually it's very hard to see reality for what it is. Uh, if you are the Buddha, if you stand above all of this, you look at things in a very different way. Uh, and to, just to remind you, I will tell you the story which actually gives the answer to this conundrum, because this is found in the Magandya Sutta, Majjhima number 75, that gives you the answer for how this is possible. It talks about the same charcoal pit, and it gives you a full simile to explain how, why this is happening. And in that Sutta, the Buddha is talking to a wanderer called Magandya, and uh, he says, the Magandya is one of these wanderers who is indulging in sensual pleasures. Yeah, You would think that uh, an ascetic wouldn't indulge in sensual pleasure, but in ancient India anything was allowed. There was all kinds of people, all kinds of stripes, yeah? of some indulging in sensual pleasures, some doing all kinds of stuff. Uh. So uh, <coughs> the Buddha tries to explain to him why there's a problem. And so he says to Magandya, suppose there is a leper. Yeah, You know lepers? Uh, yeah. Uh, a leper, ha you have this very bad illness with big sores on your fingers and feet and sometimes you have digits falling off even if it gets really bad. It's a very kind of terrible illness that is now doesn't exist in most parts of the world but there are still maybe some pockets in places like India we still find lepers even to the present day here. And for a leper, uh, you would often go to a fire, a charcoal pit and you would burn your hands quite literally, cauterize your hands. Uh, and the reason you do that is because the itching uh, and the terribleness of that illness is so bad, it is preferable to burn yourself, yeah? It is better. So the Buddha says to this Magandya, well suppose there is this leper uh, and he goes to, you know, this charcoal pit uh, and he cauterizes and burns his limbs over the charcoal pit, yeah? And he does that, uh, yeah? And then later on, uh, he, uh, when he kind of comes back and he meets his family members, uh, his family members take him to a doctor, uh, yeah? the doctor kind of gets him released from that leprosy, uh, he doesn't have, he is not a leper anymore, and he, the Buddha says to Magandya, well now that he doesn't have this illness, uh, would he still go to that charcoal pit and burn his limbs over those flames? And Magandya says, of course not. And the Buddha says, uh, of course not, because it's painful. Uh, and the Buddha said, well, is it only now that the fire is painful, or was it also painful before, when he was a leper? And the Magandya says rightly that uh, it is not only painful now, it was also painful before. But before, his faculties, his ability to see, was so distorted that what was painful felt like it was happiness. Yeah. You can, see, you can see what is going on there. It feels like happiness because you have something else which is worse. Uh, and that's why you think it is happy. Uh, and this is the problem for, the, uh, for this leper. Uh. And then the Buddha says to Magandya, it's exactly the same with sensual pleasures. Uh, yeah? We perceive something as happy because our perceptions are distorted. Uh, but once you are come out of the sensual pleasures, once you get to a jhana state or whatever, there's no way you want to go back to those sensual pleasures again. Uh. You may temporarily because you forget, uh, but ultimately if you are a Buddha, if you are fully removed from those sensual pleasures, you don't want to burn yourself in the fire of sensual pleasures. Uh. So it's a very powerful simile, and it's very hard to really understand. And one of the reasons why it is so hard to understand is because the burning here is really the craving. The craving is the burning. The mind which craves uh, is a mind which is restless, a mind which is not at ease, a mind which is always driven by something. Craving itself is painful. Yeah? And we don't really see that because we always have craving inside of us to some extent. <coughs> Only when you have fully withdrawn from craving do you understand how bad it is and how it hurts you and how it burns you. Huh? And sensual pleasures are always to do with craving. It's impossible to enjoy the world of sensual pleasures without craving, without attachment. It is part and parcel of what it is. And this is the problem. 
So uh, you have to gradually withdraw, gradually withdraw, and one day see what the world without craving is, uh, and then you can understand why it is a charcoal pit, uh, and why the Buddha doesn't want to play around in that world of craving. Uh, that is what, what you have to do. Uh. So it's a gradual understanding, uh, a gradual removal, and many of you will already have some idea what this means, yeah, because uh, you have some comparative idea with how your mind is when it's peaceful, uh, so you already have some inclination what is going on here. But uh, it's uh, strong, and of course, you, for most people, when they hear this kind of thing, they think you are nuts, yeah, as a Buddhist, uh, think you're completely crazy. So I only dare, I, you know, you have to kind of choose your uh, crowd very carefully when you say these kind of things, yeah, otherwise you might get, might get stoned or something. Uh, <laughs> That's what they did in the Bible, they would stone you if they didn't like you. So um, I, I'm, I'm still alive, so I can't, I'm not stoned yet, so that's good. So, uh, <coughs> but that is that famous Magandhya teaching of uh, giving you an insight into ultimately how these things are done, yeah, and how, why, why it is problematic. And I can give you an example from real life that is kind of maybe easier to understand, and that is like smoking, yeah? If you smoke, I don't know if you have ever smoked before, if you are any smokers here, but uh, I remember when I was a student, occasionally I would smoke. I never smoked continuously, but occasionally I would have a, to be cool, yeah? So you kind of have a cigarette or a, a cigar or something. You have to be cool when you are young, that's really important. Uh, so <laughs> and so you go to a party or something and you have a cigarette, and I hated it, it was absolutely awful, yeah? It's like, <coughs> <laughs> and you cough, and it's just like, Whoa. and it's very bad for your health, of course, and all of that. But uh, you, you still, you did it. And uh, but the strange thing is that once you get addicted to the cigarette, I have never been addicted. So I don't know what it's like. I just did it very occasionally. But once you get addicted to it, you have to have it. It is so nice. Yeah, it's like, whoa, finally a cigarette. Yeah, because the craving is so strong. Yeah. And the reason is not because the cigarette is any nicer, it is still exactly the same taste as before, it's still as horrible, but the craving makes it feel as if it is nice. It's exactly the same thing as this simile here, yeah? Most of it is just the craving here. The craving is the problem. And you take the cigarette, not because it's nice, but to get rid of the craving here. So it's like a real con job. Yeah, you get yourself into an agit agitated state of craving so that you can then get released from it afterwards. And all of this gives you a very distorted kind of sense of meaning, yeah? That you kind of are doing something useful, building up craving, getting it down, building up craving, getting it down, one cigarette after the other. It's kind of craziness, it doesn't take you anywhere, and it kills you in the process. But still, that's what people do, uh, and that's what cigarette smoking is about. Uh, that is, it gives you an idea what this simile, I think, is, uh, is saying here. Uh. What do you think? Yes? <laughs> okay. No, very, very wise. So that's good. It's high, so don't worry too much about it. If you can't relate to this, if you think it's all a bunch of rubbish, it's okay. Yeah, you are allowed to think that. Uh, don't, just. Uh, Leave it on the side burner for a while and see if it kind of comes together maybe at a later stage. Uh, you're not, you're not, we don't demand you to believe in these things, uh, you know, like a blind faith or anything like that. Uh, so you are allowed to have your doubts. Uh, and uh, it is natural to have doubts about these things because they do seem a bit far-fetched sometimes. You've got to, you've got to admit that. Uh. So let's go on to the next one here. <coughs> Okay, page 75 at the top. Householder, suppose a man dreamt about lovely parks, lovely groves, lovely meadows, and lovely lakes. And on waking, he saw nothing of it. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a dream by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Yeah? You know, sensual pleasures, there's the, always the thinking about it beforehand, the thinking what it will be like, and the reality never lives up to the thinking mind. The more you kind of think about how wonderful it's going to be, this holiday or this sensual thing you want to do, or this relationship you're going to have, they never really live up to the billing, as they say. It's never as good as the dream and the fantasy here. 
I used to have lots of dreams when I was a student. I thought, yeah, I'm going to be like this kind of person. I'm going to be like, a, you know, you know, <laughs> when you're young, you really conceited the bad things. I'm going to have this kind of girlfriend. I'm going to have this kind of job. I'm going to do, you know, do whatever. <laughs> And uh, of course, you end up as a Buddhist monk instead. So it was a big waste of time thinking about those things. Uh, yeah. So, it, the, the, and but the reality is, most people they dream about these things, and then they go through life, uh, and it never really turns out the way they dream. Uh, and even if they get the things they dream, actually, they're never as satisfying as you think you think they're going to be. Uh, in your mind, things are blown up out of proportion. Uh, everything is always better than the reality. It's like a uh, uh, <coughs> it's like kind of the best possible world is what you see in your mind. Reality is always a letdown in comparison. And so then as you go through life, you kind of reduce your ambitions a little bit. And you reduce them, and you reduce them, and you reduce them. Uh, and eventually, you just die. Yeah? Uh, and then the kind of the ambitions are gone down to zero. Uh, Buddhism is a very optimistic <laughs> teaching. And, but this is true. I think, if you think about it carefully, the dreams that we have of uh, life are so different from the reality. Uh, and this is just the, the way things always have to be, in a sense. And that's why we keep on pursuing these things, uh, and why they never give that satisfaction that we think they will have. Uh. So remember, all the objects that we're searching for, all the relationships we're trying to get, uh, all of that, it is not really real. It is a dream. Uh, and uh, the truth is often quite different. Now we come to the simile I have talked about already here on a number, number of occasions. Uh, <coughs> suppose a man borrowed goods on loan, a fancy carriage, fine jeweled earrings, uh, and preceded and surrounded by those goods, uh, he went to the marketplace. Uh, and people seeing him would say, Sirs, that is a rich man. That is how the rich enjoy their wealth. Then the owners, whenever they saw him, would take back their things. What do you think, householder? Would that be enough for that man to become dejected? Yes, venerable sir. Why is that? Because the owners took back their things. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Sensual objects or sensual pleasures, especially sensual objects, uh, have been compared to borrowed goods by the Blessed One. Uh, they provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Uh, everything we own in life, we own temporarily. Actually, we don't own it at all. Everything is just borrowed goods. Everything we have, yeah, absolutely everything, including our physical body, is just borrowed goods. Uh, it will last for a while, then you have to throw it out because it's kind of gone by, it's used by data. Uh, and uh, if you can think of life like that, uh, borrowed goods, borrowed goods, uh, you will have a very different attitude to the way you deal with things you think you own. Uh, yeah? If everything you have is borrowed, uh, your attitude will be so different to these things. Uh, so think about what that attitude is. Uh, it's a bit like the difference between renting a car and owning a car. Yeah? It's a bit like that. Uh, so what is that difference? Uh, and you, just because you rent a car doesn't mean that you treat it badly. If you are a good person, you still treat it well. Uh, but you don't, still don't treat it in the way that you treat the car that you own. Uh, and that distinction in treatment, uh, and that distinction in how we feel about it, and how we attach to it or don't attach to it, uh, that is the significant difference there. Uh, so if you are able to think of everything in your life as borrowed goods, uh, everything except for one thing, uh, there's one thing which is not borrowed goods, and that is your mind. Uh, and that is what you need to polish up and make bright, uh, because that is what's going to go with you into the, into the long term in the future. Uh. So again, it's about investing wisely, uh, knowing where to invest. Uh, yeah? And as I like to say, don't go to Goldman Sachs, don't go to the investment banks. Yeah? They don't know how to invest. Uh, they don't know anything. Uh. They're kind of this, this world. They haven't got a clue about the, anything beyond this life. The best investment advisors, uh, Buddhist monks. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, we are number one. <laughs> we we think long term. Nobody else thinks as long term as we do. <laughs> so remember that one piece of advice. So yeah. Uh, anyway, so this is a, it's a very beautiful way of thinking because it gets your mind in the right track. Yeah, thinking in the right way. Yeah? 
thinking for the long term, thinking what is really valuable in life, uh, what we really own. Ultimately, we don't even own our minds. Yeah? Ultimately, even our minds are impermanent, but it's much more permanent, much more sense of ownership, uh, the kamma. Even the Buddha says that we are owners of our kamma. Yeah? So that is much more so than these things of the world, which are very, very ephemeral and impermanent. Uh, but because ultimately the mind also is impermanent and problematic, ultimately we get rid of that as well. But in the meantime, develop that mind. Then you are on the way anyway. It's the same way that leads to both happiness and future life, but also ultimately leads to Nibbana. So you're on the right track anyway. So you can't go wrong with that kind of approach. So, there you are. Now, last simile. I'm going a little bit faster than usual because I often do these similes in great detail, but you have to do different speeds, different times. That's, that's okay, I think. Yeah. <coughs> so this is the last simile, page 76. Householder, suppose there were a dense grove not far from some village or town within which there was a tree laden with fruit, but none of its fruit had fallen to the ground. Then a man came needing fruit, seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit, and he entered the grove and saw the tree laden with fruit. Thereupon he thought, this tree is laden with fruit, but none of its fruit has fallen to the ground. I know how to climb a tree, so let me climb this tree, eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag. And he did so. Then a second man came, needing fruit, seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit, and taking a sharp axe, he too entered the grove and saw that tree laden with fruit. Then he thought, this tree is laden with fruit, but none of its fruit has fallen to the ground. I do not know how to climb a tree, so let me cut this tree down at its root, eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag. And he did so. What do you think, householder, if that first man who had climbed the tree doesn't come down quickly? When the tree falls, wouldn't he break his hand or his foot or some other part of his body so that he might incur death or death-like suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to fruits on a tree by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. So, uh, the dense forest grove. What is the dense forest grove? Well, this is like Kama Loka, the world of sensual pleasures, yeah, that you enter when you are born uh, and you come into Kama Loka. We live our whole life in this Kama Loka. We don't know what it is. Uh, and we're just stuck in this dense forest grove uh, and we have no overview. We don't really know what is going on. Uh, and we wander around on the paths of these dense forest groves looking at the various trees, hoping to find some delightful thing that we can enjoy. And this is like our lives in Karma Loka, building up the pleasures of life, building up the objects, <coughs> and then enjoying it as we go around. And occasionally, as you wander around in this Karma Loka, you find some beautiful sensual objects, like a tree laden with fruit. You think, wow, look at this. Yeah? Maybe there's a relationship, or maybe there's some kind of wonderful thing that you always wanted, or whatever it is that I it is your desire, or some beautiful entertainment, or, or who knows what. Uh, and then you climb that tree, it's like a metaphor for clinging, yeah? You literally cling when you climb. Uh, you get into that tree and you enjoy that sensual pleasure, that relationship, or that thing it is that you have, and you sit there eating those mangoes, yeah? Whoa, those sweet mangoes. Uh, I got some really nice mangoes for lunch every day, did you get the same? Uh, I, maybe just me, because I was very lucky, because I, <laughs> people give me some very beautiful mangoes every day. So I know mangoes are really nice. So mangoes, we assume that these fruits are mangoes, yeah? Just right, just rightly ripe, not overripe, not too green, just right mangoes. Uh, is there anyone who doesn't like mangoes here? Usually everyone likes mangoes, yeah? And this is kind of the nice thing about mangoes. Everyone likes it, so it's a universal fruit that everyone likes. Uh, so mangoes, yeah, tree full of mangoes. So you sit there eating these beautiful mangoes that are just nice, uh, 
And then as you do that, yeah, when you are really enjoying yourself, what happens? Uh, when you are really enjoying yourself, you become heedless. Uh, yeah? You don't really know what is going on. Uh, you have lose your ability to see what is right and what is wrong in your life. This is the problem with uh, enjoyment and indulgence. You become intoxicated by what you are doing. In Buddhism, it is not just alcohol that intoxicates you. It is all these other things that also lead to intoxication. It takes your mind away from what actually really matters in life. And if you get, forget yourself. And this is why so many people in the world end up with uh, cheating on their partner in life. Yeah? Why? Because they are intoxicated by the ability to actually have an affair with someone else. It happens so much. If you read the statistics about people doing this thing, it's incredibly high. Over 50% in, in men and women, I don't know if it is the same in all countries, but I assume it is roughly the same everywhere because human nature tends to be the same everywhere. So over 50% are men and women, and women are only slightly behind men. It's, it's all very close together, yeah? And who actually do this kind of thing. It's a very, very high percentage. And of course, this is exactly what is going on here. You are just intoxicated. You lose your sense of danger. You lose the sense that you are endangering your marriage, you're endangering the possibility of seeing your children in the future, and you are destroying so much and causing so much suffering for other people when you go into these kind of things. But this is, this is kind of a, the meaning here. So you sit in that tree, indulging yourself, doing things that are bad, doing things that cause suffering in the long term for yourself and also for others. And sometimes you do much worse things than that. Sometimes you steal, you cheat, you even kill because of that indulgence in sensual pleasures because it will give you some advantage. Yeah? And then while you are doing that, then the axe man comes at the bottom to chop down the tree. Who is that axe man? That axe man is just nature. Yeah, it's just nature says that your time is up, yeah? And then the tree comes crashing down in the middle of you indulging yourself, in the middle of you doing bad acts. The whole thing comes crashing down. And unless you get your mindfulness back quickly, come down from that tree, you will be in serious trouble. Coming down from that tree means that you realize you're on the wrong path and you kind of get back on the right path again. And this is the danger with the sensual world, is that it can be intoxicating. Yeah? Sometimes we get uh, experience in life that kind of brings it back to our senses because we suffer a lot. Uh, but then we, instead of using that experience of impermanence and problems to guide us on the spiritual path, uh, what human beings often do instead, uh, we try to drown out the suffering with more sensual pleasures. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, if you ha suffer a lot, uh, you try to Let's go to the fridge and eat something. Uh, let's enjoy some entertainment or movies. We can blank out. Uh, let us use drugs and alcohol to blank everything out completely. One of the reasons why people become drug addicts is because they have a lot of suffering. Uh, and they want to blank it out. Uh, it is not a good answer to suffering, but that's why people do it. So it is kind of... Uh, and this is the, what the Buddha says. He says actually in the, in the suttas, he specifically says that the only escape that an ordinary person knows from suffering essential pleasures. Uh, yeah? that's, the, so that's the escape they have. So you actually seek it and then you make it worse. But the person who is wise, when they have suffering, they stand back and say, this is the nature of life. Uh, how can I get out of this in a way which actually is useful? Uh, yeah? This is the right way of thinking about suffering. And this is why we've been talking about the first noble truth at such length, to understand the nature of suffering in life. Uh, so we can use this to make some wise decisions rather than perpetuating the problem endlessly. Yeah. So, this simile then is uh, this is what it is about, this intoxication. So, what is the alternative? Uh? And the alternative, of course, is to try to get out of that jungle, to see it from above instead of being within it. Yeah, and this is that simile that you will remember that Ajahn Brahm talks about in his book when he went to the Mayan pyramids in uh, Guatemala, in Central America, but it's also a simile found in the suttas, exactly the same simile found in the suttas, uh, where two friends climb up a mountain, yeah? same kind of idea. And uh, in the suttas, the simile is two friends coming along, uh, and they come to a mountain or a hill, and one friend says to the other one, let's climb the hill together. And the other one said, nah, I couldn't be bothered, yeah, you, you go if you want to go. So one of the one guy goes up, and the other one stays at the bottom. And then when the fellow comes to the top, he says, well, 
I'm on the top now. I've got the bird's eye view. I can see out. And it's amazing what I can see. You won't believe it. I can see villages and roads going around. I can see the forest and the plains and the fields and the rivers going around. I can see all of this from the top of this mountain. Come up and have a look. And the other fellow said, no, nah, I don't believe you. I don't believe you see any of that. Yeah, this is the fellow stuck in sensual pleasure. They don't believe you that you can see something from high up from samadhi that you cannot see when you are in the jungle. It's very hard to uh, understand that. The whole purpose of the simile is to show a whirling, a prince who is stuck in sensual pleasure, that there is some, some such thing as samadhi. That's actually the purpose of the simile. So then the fellow on top of the mountain, he goes down. He grabs his friend by the arm and pulls him up to the top. Yeah? This is like the Buddha trying to pull us up to the top of the mountain. Yeah? The Buddha comes, come! And we say, no, don't want to go. Come this way, this happiness. No, I'm happy already. Uh, this is how we are. It's like Ajahn Brahm's, the load of dung, yeah, the worm and his happy load of drung, dung. That's exactly what it, that simile is. Uh. Eventually he pulls him up to the top, uh, and then when he goes to the top, he says, well, look, what do you see? <coughs> uh, well, I see villages, paths, rivers. You were right. <laughs> you feel a bit sheepish because you've been de denying it all the time. But actually, your spiritual friend, the Buddha, was right all along. There was a magnificent view. There is a bird's eye view when you can understand the whole world from a different perspective. And that is what this is about. And then you give up those sensual pleasures because there is something far more satisfactory to be had. And you understand that giving up the whole sensual world, at least giving up craving and attachment for it, uh, is the right way. But you can only fully understand it once you have extracted yourself from the sensual realm, just like the tadpole coming out of the water for the first time as a frog, for the first time understands what it is all about. And is that simile? It's beautiful, it is profound, and it's just uh, very nice. So I leave it there for you to contemplate and think about. So um, uh, let us have another break and have a little bit longer one this time, half an hour at least. And then we can come back and summarize a bit and talk about things uh, afterwards, after the half an hour. See you later on.